Knowing about human evolution provides really important context for that kind of research uh, in terms of thinking about human adaptability, modern human adaptability, as well as our limits to adaptability. So uh, I teach about human evolution and I stay up on um, new finds in paleoanthropology and I find it to be a really exciting field because every year there are multiple new scientific discoveries. And so I'll talk about a couple of those towards the end, um, but I'm gonna start actually with trying to provide a very general overview of the fossil record um, to provide context. And then I'll talk about some of those new finds and how those new discoveries are changing uh, models of human evolution in biological anthropology. So that's my, my plan. And then of course questions at the end as well. Or if you need to ask questions during, feel free to interrupt me too. Uh, I'm actually going to start with a primate classification chart that focuses on the living primates. But what I want you to draw your attention to is down here, right? So this is um, uh, most inclusive to least inclusive, right? In terms of the hierarchy of uh, taxonomic classification. So down here at the species level, our species, Homo sapiens, we're the only living member of our species. There are no subspecies today of, of humans. Um, we're the only living member of our genus as well. And, oh, this is a touch screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I spoiled the surprise. <laughs> and so we're the only living member, not just of our species and our genus, but our tribe too. Um, and that hasn't always been the case, as we'll talk about here in a second. But on this chart, what I wanted to draw your attention to I don't want to touch it, <laughs> but this point right here, and that is the divergence of our tribe and the tribe of our closest evolutionary relatives that are living today, chimpanzees and bonobos. And so this is really a critical point to start a discussion of human evolution. And so that's really where I'm going to focus. Um, I'm focused on about seven million years, really, really quickly. <laughs> Zip through seven million years in here. So when you think about modern humans today compared to our closest evolutionary relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, you know, what do you think distinguishes us? What does it mean to be human instead of a chimpanzee or a bonobo? What are like hallmarks of humanity that you think of in terms of distinguishing us from our closest relatives? Probably sophisticated cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's made possible by large, complexly organized brains. Absolutely. Anything else? We're not as hairy. <laughs> we're not as hairy. No, we're not. And that makes us really efficient sweaters, actually, too. <laughs> it's good for thermoregulation. Anything else? There's something about thumbs. Oh, yeah, we have lots of primate trait in general, grasping hands, and most primates have grasping feet too, but um, the opposability of our thumbs is pretty impressive, right? We can touch all of our fingers as well as the palm of our hand. Um, those thumbs let us do lots of things like make and use really sophisticated tools. Another thing that's usually, at least classically, considered one of those hallmarks of humanity, sophisticated tool use. Up, up, upright walking. Yes, yeah. yeah, bipedalism, as opposed to quadrupedalism, which we see in chimpanzees and bonobos. We walk around on two limbs. Yeah. What about refined motor skills? Like, I don't know if they, the chimpanzees have dances, but we have ballet people. <laughs> You know, yeah, like the coordination. Yeah, the coordination that humans have is pretty impressive. I mean, just the coordination that bipedalism requires, right? Walking, and it's just something we learn to do, and we just do it without thinking about all of that coordination. Um, chimpanzees and bonobos can walk around bipedally, facultatively, but that's not their primary form of locomotion. So when, when we're thinking about those kind of traits then, I guess the other one I would add would be culture. <laughs> it's a hallmark of humanity, right? Um, ways of thinking that influence patterns of behavior that are shared by groups of people and really help us to um, deal with the different environments that we live in, right? Culture can be adaptive. Um, but when we think about all those kinds of traits, it turns out that they, these features of humanness evolve at different times and different rates during the course of human evolution. It's not all at once. Um, and actually what we see first is bipedalism. So uh, walking around on just two limbs. And so how do you get to be a member of our tribe? Tribe 
showing evidence of bipedalism. Um, and so in this uh, figure here, you see a human skeleton and a chimpanzee skeleton. So we can look um, for evidence of locomotion in the fossils that we find. Um, and a lot of the differences, as you see here, um, between humans and chimpanzees are related to our form of locomotion, how we walk around. Um, because humans are not only habitual bipeds, our primary form of locomotion, but we say humans are also obligate bipeds, in that we're, we're obligated to walk around on two limbs. We don't locomote very effectively any other way. Whereas like chimpanzees, for instance, I mentioned they can walk, walk around bipedally, um, they can also use quadrupedalism. They also do a lot of climbing and leaping and things like that, and much more flexibility. We're specialized for bipedalism. Um, and so we, we can see this in um, our skeletal anatomy. And so I'm just gonna point out a couple things uh, about our skeleton, and then we can look for these features in the fossils we find to get an idea about locomotion. And we can really see bipedalism from head to toe. Um, can't see it so well in this picture, but if we think about the Foramen magnum, the big hole um, for our spinal cord, right at the, at the base of our skull. Um, our foramen magnum is farther underneath the skull than a chimpanzee, because we hold our head above our body as opposed to out in front of our body, right? So a chimpanzee would be further <coughs> towards the back. So we see evidence there. Um, moving down, it would help if I had a whole um, model that I could point to. If we look at our spine, our spine um, is an S-shaped curve. There's a backward and then a forward curve. Uh, and that's important in terms of um, keeping our upper body centered over our pelvis. Um, our pelvis is very different than a chimpanzee, as you can see in that figure, and you can also see here. So human pelvis versus a chimpanzee pelvis, right? The human pelvis is basin-shaped or bowl-shaped, right? Um, the important thing about this is that, again, it's going to be um, helpful for weight transmission, upper body over the lower body, also cradling our organs as well. Uh, moving on down then, if we look at our, our legs first, I hope you are uh, noticing that they're long. <laughs> we have long yeah, legs uh, yeah. <laughs> relative to our arms. Chimpanzees have long arms relative to the length of their legs. So we have elongated lower limbs, good for stride length, right? Um, longer stride lengths. Um, also take a look at our femurs, the upper, the large upper leg bone. It's angled inward. We call that a valgus angle. We don't see that in chimpanzees. You can just see that pretty simply. This is a human femur, and this is a chimpanzee femur. You can see the angle inward towards the knee there, as opposed to the chimpanzee that doesn't. So that keeps our legs beneath our body. Moving down to our knee, our knee is a little bit different too. A modified knee anatomy. This is very much a uh, load-bearing joint, right? We don't get to spread out our weight over four limbs like a chimpanzee does. Um, so there's some modifications there, and we can also fully extend our knee joints, too. Our feet, and our feet, it's very obvious that we're specialized for bipedalism. So if you take a look, this is a gorilla foot, and this is a human foot, right? So um, our feet, unlike our hands, are not grasping. Gorilla feet, chimpanzee feet, bonobo feet, they're very grasping. We see um, long toes, we see a, a divergent big toe as well. When it comes to human feet, we've got our big toe in line with our other short little toes, right? These are basically weight-bearing platforms, specialized for bipedalism. We do have a bit of an arch here as well, good in terms of absorbing shock, keeping the spring, and our step. So we see these traits in modern humans, but we expect to see them in other um, habitual and obligate bipeds too. So this is what we look for in the fossil record. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to point out about this chimpanzee here, too, is um, see how different the shoulder positioning is ah. <laughs> um, compared to the modern human. Uh, that's relating to climbing adaptations, as are the long arms that we talked about a second ago. Notice mm -hmm. also the long curved fingers, as well as the grasping toes, and you can see that. that did they have to have all those before they can walk upright, or did no. uh, I mean? chicken egg thing. Exactly. Yeah. Would we expect that, boom, all of these yeah. changes happen right. at once? No. No, it's gradual. And we can see that in the fossil record. Okay. Hopefully we will see that. Quick right. question. Yeah. So the, what is it, the radius and the ulna, mm -hmm. are they bowed outward? Or are is they, that just the drawing? I think it's just the drawing there and how the arms are being held. 
so I mentioned that bipedalism, we start to see earliest, evolve earliest. Large, complexly organized brains, those come later in human evolution, which is what this figure is showing. So the way that we uh, measure brain size is generally in terms of cranial capacity. Uh, when we're talking millions of years ago, brains don't stick around in the fossil record. They decompose, and so we use skull volume as a measure of brain size. And so we measure it in cubic centimeters. And if we're looking at um, our closest relatives, the great apes, we tend to see cranial capacities in the 300s, in the 400s, 300 cubic centimeters, 400 cubic centimeters, maybe up to about 500 cubic centimeters. Where um, with humans, the cr our cranial capacities are enormous, 1,350 cubic centimeters on average for modern humans today. So much bigger than our closest relatives, also much bigger than the earliest bipeds too. So, so if we're looking at these different species that you see here, and you're looking at cranial capacity down here, um, they're still in that same range, that same small range in the usually upper uh, 300s to the lower 500s, just like the great apes today, and yet they're bipedal. When we think about Homo erectus, um, Homo erectus is a, a fully modern biped, modern in terms of limb proportions, height, weight, and yet still only has a brain that's about 75% the size of ours today. So brains take longer to evolve than bipedalism. And so that's why we focus on bipedalism first um, and foremost when it comes to our tribe. So who are the earliest members of our tribe? Well, paleoanthropologists disagree about that, but we have some candidates. Um, as far as estimating when in time Humans diverged from our closest relatives, the bonobos and chimpanzees. Uh, geneticists have suggested that it's probably between four and eight million years ago. And if you notice here, these, our fossils match up pretty well with those expectations. And so we have um, four species that are good candidates for early hominins. Um, the fossils are somewhat limited and so um, we often call them possible hominids because um, there is some evidence of bipedalism, but we're not gonna see it to the same extent as we will with later hominids. And um, so we've got these fossils, if you notice, all come from Africa. Um, our oldest fossils so far come from Central Africa, and then we've also got um, three other species that come from East Africa, dating from maybe as much as six to seven million years ago. Um, and then we'll see in the next slide, Arctopithecus ramidus, which is about 4.4 million years ago. Um, so something else that's interesting besides the location of these sites for early possible hominins um, is the environments that they were living in. All, for all of these species, the environments have been reconstructed to have been forested environments. So that's interesting in terms of the origins of bipedalism. And most people think, oh, bipedalism is good in an open environment, in a savanna environment. And that might be the case, but it looks like it may have evolved in a forested environment and then was refined in a more open, mixed or savanna <coughs> environment. So that's kind of interesting about these early hominins. Um, and so here, this is our earliest, actually I have the cast here. This is Sahelanthropus chadensis uh, from Chad, from Central Africa. Um, and what we're talking about here in terms of these hominins might be that they're bipedal but as you can see here, especially, they're ape-like in a lot of ways. Um, this looks like an ape, right? In terms of the, the artist's reconstruction here. Um, but we're talking about ape-sized bodies, chimp-sized bodies, and chimp-sized brains um, for these earliest hominids, like cranial capacities in the 300s, maybe four feet tall for these earliest hominids. So there are some um, pictures of fossils from Aurorantugonensis. They all have great names. Right? Uh, bipedalism uh, based on the femur. Looks more like ours than a chimpanzee's. Uh, Artipithecus kadawa um, from East Africa, uh, possibly bipedal based on a toe bone. Limited fossils, right? I mentioned a second ago. We do have a better, more complete skeleton for uh, Artipithecus ramidus. Um, actually, uh, she is nicknamed Artie. Maybe you've seen some publications in recent years about Artie. Uh, this, these are the fossils that we have, and these are the reconstructions and the artist's reconstruction of Artie. Again, very ape-like, chimp-sized um, body and brain, four feet tall, 
um, cranial capacity in the lower 300s. Um, bipedal, we start to see changes associated with bipedalism, so here for instance. Um, but check out those feet. Grassy feet. Yes. So does this look more like ours? Or does it look more like a gorilla's, right? We have a divergent big toe, right? So probably pretty grasping feet. Um, the idea being that Artie and early hominins in general were probably still spending time in the trees. Right? So they may have been bipedal on the ground, um, but still really good at climbing. Uh, they've also suggested, paleoanthropologists have also suggested that she would have been maybe a good bipedal walker, but a terrible runner because of <laughs> that divergent big toe grasping feet. So those are our earliest possible hominins. Uh, we know much more about the next group, often known as the Australopids. So we know more because um, the finds have been around longer. There's been more time to interpret them and discuss them. We also have more fossils uh, that are categorized into this group too. Uh, as far as time, so if you think of, of, of Artie being about 4.4 million years ago, our earliest Australopith is about 4.2 million years ago. That's Australopithecus animensis, which Doug mentioned earlier, um, uh, that recent study that skull has been found. Um, up until about a million years ago for some forms of the Australopiths, like these robust forms here. Like the earliest hominins, the Australopiths so far only come from Africa. We have sites in East Africa and in Central Africa, as well as South Africa, that have been categorized into the genus Australopithecus or Coranthropus. Um, so traditionally, all of these fossils were put into the same genus, Australopithecus. <coughs> But over time, as we do, we revised classification in paleoanthropology, and now we put the Australopiths who have more lightly built skulls into this genus, Australopithecus, and the Australopiths who have more heavily built skulls, or the robust forms, into the genus Paranthropus. Um, and so sometimes you'll see all of these forms referred to as Australopithecus, and sometimes you'll see this, um, dis this distinction being made. As far as the, uh, the these Australopiths, um, the, the more lightly built skulls, these Australopiths were around on that earlier end of this, this um, these years, uh, about 4.2 million years ago, up until maybe 2 million years ago, whereas the more robust forms were around from about 2.5 million years ago up until about a million years ago. And so as far as the differences that um, are considered to be significant here. Um, the skulls are more heavily built, we've got larger molars, thicker enamel on those molars, large jaws, large muscle attachments um, here, and a large brow ridge in, in some cases, a ridge of bone down, this is called a sagittal crest, down the, the midline of the skull, and often a, a muscle attachments at the back of the neck get a hold of those heavy faces with, with large muscles. So the idea is, is that perhaps these robust forms were doing a lot of heavy, powerful chewing. In other words, they were eating a lot of hard foods. Um, and so with regard to the, these robust forms, the idea is, is that these are probably an evolutionary dead end. We don't have any living descendants today. The Australopiths that are more lightly built, though, look a lot more, so this is to see look a lot more like early members of our genus. And so it was probably a gracile Australopith that was ancestral to the genus Homo, our genus. Do we know what kind of food they were eating, the robust form? Like the, what kind of hard foods, like um, um, hard-shelled fruit and nuts and tubers and things like that. Uh, but chemical analysis of the teeth has also suggested that they ate some meat, which could also be insects. So they weren't completely maybe specializing on hard foods. So as far as the Australopiths, we have more evidence of bipedalism um, in terms of the skeleton, but also we've got like, um, footprints too. So maybe you've seen these pictures before from uh, a site in East Africa that dates back 3.6, 3.7 million years ago in Tanzania where we've got um, footprints from multiple individuals more recently, even more footprints have been found too. We've seen that in the news as well. So these footprints are helpful in terms of thinking about um, locomotion, bipedalism, but also thinking about 
body size too. So again, with the Australopiths, just like with the earliest hominids, we're talking about small body hominids. They're probably three and a half feet tall, maybe to five feet tall. Females being on the low end, males being on the high end. There's a lot of sexual dimorphism, we think, in these Australopiths. Um, in the new set of footprints, um, one individual has, it's been suggested that one individual was maybe five and a half feet tall, which is like, would make that individual, probably male, the tallest Australopith that we know of at this point. So new discoveries every day there. So footprints, um, we also can take a look at those uh, changes that we would expect with bipedalism. So we're looking here at these. These two hominins are um, classified as Australopithecus sediba from South Africa, and this is Lucy in the middle. So Australopithecus afarensis there in, in the middle. And so if we look at like the position of the foramen magnum, it's farther under the skull, um, you can see here the pelvis in all three more basin shaped compared to what we would see elongated pelvis in, in a chimpanzee. Uh, the femurs are angled inward pretty clearly there as well. But then you also see those shoulders that look more like the chimp we just looked at, right? Um, you can also see down here grasping feet. Um, also, if we look at the arms, well, we don't see an elongation of the lower limbs. The arms are still longer than the legs. Um, also, we tend to see longer and more curved fingers. Finger curvature that's kind of in between um, what we have, which are not curved fingers, and like a chimpanzee or a gorilla, for instance. So the idea is, is yes, they're bipedal, and yet, like those earliest hominids, probably still spending time in the trees. We don't see the changes all at once. Bipedalism is gonna be refined over time. Um, also, in terms of brain size, um, we're talking about small cranial capacities, just like the earliest hominids too. So cranial capacities in the 300s, 400s, maybe for some of those robust forms into the low 500s. So chimp-sized bodies, chimp-sized brains, and yet, bipedal. I wanna ask you, do you have any um, estimates that um, of a high mortality rate in birth because they were so little, the people? Yeah, that's such a good question. So as far as like life expectancy, yeah. what the suggestion has been is it was probably, life expectancy at birth was probably about 20, but if they actually made it through infancy and childhood, probably some individuals lived into their 40s. That's more like what we would see for um, chimpanzees in the wild too, like maybe into your 40s. Uh, and, and as far as, you know, are these apex predators? No. <laughs> in fact, we have um, some fossils that show signs that um, they were killed by predators um, and moved by scavengers as well, like in hyena dens, for instance. And so, uh, yes, I, can, I think we can expect that mortality was probably But pretty. what about in childbirth? You know, um, I, I wonder, the people were so tiny, was there, pelvis accommodate or was the, the fetus tiny? I mean, it seemed that they would have a heck of a time delivering. Well, the, I guess the one thing, advantage they had on their side, small brains. Um, so one thing that makes childbirths are difficult in modern humans today is that we give birth to large-brained infants. Oh. And their infants weren't as large-brained. And so, um, yes, their pelvis has been restructured for bipedalism, but they're still giving birth to small-brained Infants. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so the idea is that one of these grassal australopithecines was ancestral to our genus. Which one? That depends on who you ask. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion. Trying to figure out um, ancestor descendant relationships is really difficult. Um, but we do have the earliest members of our genus starting somewhere between 2.3 million years ago and 2.8 million years ago. Why the range? Well, because it keeps getting pushed back in time. And, oh, we found a new jaw bone, and that pushes it back to 2.8 million years ago. So whenever you see dates here, expect they will change over time with, with new discoveries. And so um, our genus keeps getting pushed back in time as well. But you know, this makes sense given what we were talking about for the grassile australopiths, you know, being around from 4.2 million years ago to around 2 million years ago. So early members of our genus were coexisting with the robust forms, paranthropists, right? But maybe they were exploiting different niches. Um, and so 
what can we say about these early members of our genus? Well, they're still really small. They're still like australopiths in a lot of ways. Still chimp-sized in terms of their bodies, so still maybe three and a half, four and a half feet tall, but we do see a bit of an increase in brain size, about a 20% increase in brain size over the australopiths. So instead of cranial capacities in the 300s and 400s, on average, early members of our genus had cranial capacities in the 600s, some even larger than that. Um, in fact, there's a lot of variation for these sort of early years of our genus. Um, and so uh, Homo habilis is the traditional species that's designated for the, as the earliest member of our genus. But some paleoanthropologists have argued that there's so much variation, we need to start splitting these fossils into different species. And that's what you're seeing here. So some are larger, um, overall larger, and larger cranial capacities than others. So some paleoanthropologists would call this Homo rudolfensis and this Homo habilis. Um, so there are all these, always these taxonomic discussions going on in um, paleoanthropology. So a little bit bigger in terms of brain size. Um, some, some differences also in the skull, the faces are a little bit flatter, the teeth are a little bit smaller, but again, still very similar to an, a gracile australopith. Um, an interesting thing about these uh, early members of our genus is that they're definitely associated with stone tools. Uh, were they the first stone tool users? We used to think so. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> That's gotten pushed back to the australopiths too, um, based on the, the time and the dates of some early tools they were found in Kenya, actually date back to about 3.3 million years ago. Um, for these kinds of tools that are associated with our genus, they're called Olduan tools, they date back to about 2.6 million years ago. Um, and so they're put into kind of a different industry than these newer tools that, that have been found in, in Kenya. So we know that um, Homo habilis was a stone tool user, which is a pretty big deal in terms of technology, increasing technology. But those are pretty simple tools <laughs> that you see there in that picture. Um, and using relatively simple methods to make those tools. But when they would take a, a hard hammer, a stone, and, and strike another stone to remove a flake, what that creates is a sharp edge. An edge that's sharper than, say, like um, nails or teeth when it comes to cutting. And so these were probably multi-purpose tools used for a variety of functions. But um, that also includes butchering animal carcasses, dismembering animal carcasses. Now again, is this an apex predator um, hunting? No, <laughs> this is a little hominid that's probably scavenging, right? And in fact, having those two tools to get in there, get meat and get out of there quickly before that predator or other scavengers can run is probably an advantage. Um, and so we see stone tools um, and a little bit bigger brains when it comes to the earliest members of our genus. As far as the sites here, East Africa for, for Homo habilis. I have a question. Yeah. So it, it seems like um, probably prior to the Homo period uh, genus, it, we were seeing maybe more um, physical traits and less interaction with the brain and its capacity to think and analyze and form ideas, that sort of thing. And so uh, tools obviously brings that relationship together. Um, so is that probably why, is that where we're seeing, or can we assume then that brain development um, based on the skull size and the capacity it is something that came after they were able to survive their physical environment? It, I mean, how does that relationship connect? Yeah. I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, I think a lot of people were kind of thinking. So that's something we're still really yes. exploring. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the traditional assumption is, oh, you have a larger brain size, larger cranial capacity. That must mean uh, better cognitive abilities, right? And better cognitive abilities must be beneficial in terms of survival, um, avoiding predators, getting food, right? Making Using tools. tools. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, we're starting to see with the australopiths, those are those tools from Kenya that I mentioned, um, unless Homo habilis gets pushed back over three million years ago. We'll see. Um, but we also, in some, at some sites, we have um, animal bones with what looks like stone tool marks that, again, are, are closer to australopith sites. Um, and then there's like the tools that don't stick around in the fossil record, like that chimpanzees use. Um, we wouldn't expect to find like a termite 
fishing stick, right? That chimpanzees, we wouldn't expect to find that in the fossil record. So it doesn't necessarily mean that australopiths weren't using tools, um, but it does suggest that, that sophistication in technology does increase over time in our hominin tribe. Um, but trying to pick apart all of that, you know, that's one of the challenges. Is it generally safe to say that your physical traits will advance based on survivability first? And then the brain and cognitive function. I think it's a feedback. Later, I think it's there's feedback there, right? Okay. So better cognitive ability allows you to survive, right? And then um, you can adapt to your environment, which improves your ability to survive. And so it's, it's cyclical. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So like for instance, if you're getting, um, if you have these sort of tools that give you better access to meat, uh, that's. You know, if you think about bigger brains, that's an expensive organ, right, to grow and maintain. So there's probably feedback there in terms of access to meat and larger brains, too, um, and tools. Put, the, put that in the loop as well. Okay. So from Homo habilis, then comes Homo erectus. Um, and I just have an, or actually a very early small member of the species here um, with me today. But Homo erectus, I think, is a pretty exciting species for a number of reasons. Lots of important firsts that are associated with Homo erectus. Um, for instance, if you take a look at that skeleton over there, this is actually a skeleton that dates back 1.6 million years ago. So it's a you know, long time ago, and it's like 90% complete. Um, but that's just amazing to me. <laughs> and uh, it belonged to probably a boy that was between the ages of 8 and 10. Um, he already, at between the ages of 8 and 10, was 5 foot 3 inches tall. So um, some people suggest that he would have been over 6 feet maybe as an adult. Um, but what I hope you can see there is long legs, right? And so uh, we see that elongation of the lower limbs in Homo erectus. So no longer are we talking about chimp-sized bodies. What we see with Homo erectus is fully modern body size in terms of height, in terms of weight. Um, on average, Homo erectus was probably about five feet, six inches tall, um, with some individuals over six feet tall. Um, probably pretty muscular, very active lifestyles as, as well. Um, so we don't see that those climbing, like check out up here, the shoulders look like Right? We don't see those climb, climbing adaptations um, that we were seeing retained in some of those previous species either. So fully committed to bipedalism. Uh, also in terms of brain size, um, we see an increase in brain size over uh, Homo habilis. Uh, there's quite a range actually for Homo erectus, but um, on average maybe about 900 for cranial capacities. Uh, so about 75% of our brain size today. So larger uh, brains, um, we also see some important first in terms of geographic range. So, so far we've only been talking about Africa. Um, with Homo erectus, we've got to expand our view. Uh, out of Africa, there's like tiny little map down here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Homo erectus at various sites in Africa, but also into Asia, Southeast Asia, really quite quickly, um, and Europe as well. So Homo erectus is living in um, different places and different kinds of environments uh, around the world. And um, probably one thing that's quite helpful in terms of, of adapting to those different environments are stone tool advances. Now these look like stone tools, don't they? <laughs> Compared to those old one tools we saw a second ago. Um, they're often described as bifacial hand axes. Uh, so removing flakes from both sides of the tool. So this means we're talking more sophisticated methods of making tools, um, probably taking these tools with them rather than just making them on the scene and leaving them, too. So is the theory that they evolved in Africa and then spread out? Mm -hmm. So in other parts of the world, there was nothing? There was nothing. But that's changing. <laughs> we'll get to that point right. in a second. But that's the traditional view. The Homo erectus is the first species to expand not just around Africa, but out of Africa into these other areas. And so better tools probably helped with that. Um, also, Homo erectus may have been the first hominid to use fire in a controlled way. Probably getting fire from natural sources, but then keeping it going. Think of all the benefits of that in terms of warmth, warmth and protection, and making tools, things like that. 
cooking food, all sorts of things, um, become uh, possible with fire. And so we see Homo erectus living around the world with more sophisticated tools beginning around 1.9 million years ago. And the species is around for, for almost 2 million years. It's a very dynamic, adaptable species. Yeah. Dr. What was the survival rate and longevity rate changed in from Homo erectus from what preceded? I don't know that we can say definitively. I think the assumption is that that's the case. Um, but what about a societal connection between Homo erectus and what preceded them? As far as like culture, living together, working together. It's from the fossil record. It's hard to Pretty reconstruct hard. that. We would love to have a time machine <laughs> yeah. to, to be able to study those kinds of changes. Is there any archaeology or yeah archaeology that would substantiate anything? Beyond stone tools and possible use of fire or possible use of um, like caves and not natural rock shelters as shelters, mm -hmm. that's what we can tell at this point. We don't see, and this could change, we don't see like evidence of symbolic expression yet. We don't see evidence of art yet with Homo erectus. What about populations? You know, can you see any evidence that a population in one area increase and, and possibly maybe that's why they moved on because mm -hmm. of looking for access to additional resources to support that population i think that's one hypothesis increasing pressure on research resources others would be well maybe it's also a matter of following like migratory animals um, as well so yeah there are maybe a lot of climate changes yeah climate changes for sure um, if we think about i mean the time when homo erectus is around um, you know, we have to think about the Pleistocene and what's happening in the Pleistocene. Well, there's a general decrease in temperature, like global temperatures from the Pliocene to the Pleistocene. But if you look at, at um, shorter periods of time, it's a lot of change, it's up and down. Um, and so the idea is that perhaps these trends that we're seeing in our genus are related to dealing with a changing environment. That bigger brains, better cognitive abilities, better tools made us more flexible and more successful than previous species. Because I'm just wondering, flexible. people have a tendency to like to, you have either an adventurous spirit and want to move on because you want to see what's out there, yeah. or, you know, but people have a tendency to just want to stay home and be comfortable and safe. And so I'm just wondering why would they leave right. where, where they were, especially if it, you know, meant crossing into other continents that were drastically different. Yeah. Well, and if we think about even modern humans in terms of um, our evolutionary history, you know, we spent most most of our history not as sedentary people. <laughs> yeah. You know, for most of our history, we have been, and there still are, foragers, right? Hunters and gatherers who are usually pretty mobile, um, exploiting resources, different resources that are seasonally available. So that movement um, was wasn't something that. Um, was we shouldn't expect, you know, in beyond or before modern humans either. Um, that moving around in the environment to exploit wild plants and wild animals is what we saw in the earliest humans, and that's um, the subsistence strategy that these other um, species relied on too. And so that mobility is kind of part of it. They, but, they didn't know, but I mean, exactly. it was just hit and miss. We're going they to South went the wrong way, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like they still right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it wasn't like a cotton. Yeah, we're, we're headed to uh, yeah, to our death. <laughs> yeah. um, so Homo erectus um, is is a really interesting species um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, this figure here is um, I put it in here to to show that there is though a lot of variation when it comes to our genus. Um, so traditionally, we recognized Homo habilis that we just talked about and Homo erectus, but there have been a lot of other um, potential species that have been discovered since then, too. So um, maybe you've heard of Homo floresiensis found in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, the, the press likes to call them the hobbits. Mm -hmm. they're very small, okay, <laughs> um, because they're very, they were very small in terms of their body size and their brain size, more like what we were talking about with the Australopiths than with um, Homo erectus, and yet, they share traits in common with Homo erectus, like you see here. 
Now this, this is actually from the same site. Um, this Homo erectus fossil is uh, an, um, an old fossil that is particularly small. It actually comes from um, what today? What is today? The Republic of Georgia. So probably an early um, migrant out of Africa um, in, in, in this case here. Um, so there are these similarities, and yet there's the smallness of Floresiensis, and so the question is, um, how in the world did the species get to this particular island, and why is it so small? Is this a descendant of Homo erectus that got smaller over time, or is this a descendant of another species? Did a species other than Homo erectus also expand out of Africa? Another species maybe even earlier than Homo erectus expand out of Africa. And so there's kind of mounting evidence that that might actually be the case. Um, Homo naledi, maybe you've heard of Homo naledi too in recent years in the news. Um, this is uh, one individual or the part of one individual that comes from a site in South Africa, um, from a site that's actually really difficult. They can use, um, they have to like get down into a cave in order to retrieve these uh, fossils. And so Homo naledi is interesting because Homo naledi kind of has this mix of traits. Traits that we would associate with Homo erectus, like you can see pointed out on this figure, but then also more primitive traits too, like we would, what we'd expect in early Homo or even Australopithecus. And so at first they didn't have dates for these fossils and they assumed, oh, they're going to be really old. But then they were able to date the fossils and they were like maybe 300,000 years old. Uh, so we have these different members of our genus who are coexisting um, in different parts of the world, and there's more variation than we ever expected. So those uh, views of our genus have certainly changed what is over time. The, which part? Flex occipital. So the angle of the occipital region of your skull is that back part. So it's just, um, if we were looking at humans, you would see that we have a nice rounded <laughs> occipital region. If we were looking at a Neanderthal, we would see, see that bulge? It's called the occipital bun. <laughs> it's this bulge here. <laughs> so that's what people are anthropologists do. All these little areas of the skull to compare and contrast these different fossils. So we have all this variation when it comes to earlier members of our genus. Um, but also in the middle, too. And um, when it comes to this next group, I'm going to call them pre-modern humans because it's really hard to designate a species for this group because there's just a lot of variation. And um, for the fossils that we're finding beginning around 800,000 years ago or 600,000 years ago in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, they're really a mix of traits. They have some traits that we would associate with Homo erectus, and yet they look more modern in other ways. Um, and so that's what we call them pre-modern humans. Um, Paleoanthropologists are starting to use the species designation Homo heidelbergensis more and more. So if you see that species designation, we're talking about pre-modern human. Um, just to point out some of uh, the traits that are in common, for instance, with Homo erectus, big brow ridges, um, kind of a receding forehead, uh, large faces, thicker cranial bones, um, also a receding chin as well, so they don't have pointy chins like we do. Um, but they do have larger cranial capacities like we do. So cranial capacities for this group are going to average in the 1200s. Remember us, we're like 1350, um, Homo erectus in the 900s on average. Um, so larger cranial capacities, a uh, wider top of the skull, um, the skull shape is changing a bit that looks a little bit more modern. Uh, there's a, an artist's reconstruction, perhaps, of what a pre-modern human looked like. Now, now we're not talking about hominids that look like apes anymore, right? They look like us. Um, and these pre-modern humans were hunters and gatherers, and the evidence suggests that they were making use of a lot of different kinds of resources, plants, animals, even marine resources, shellfish, for instance, at, at sites that are associated with pre-modern humans. Um, also making more sophisticated tools. Uh, there's a site in Germany where um, there are fire-hardened wooden spears that have been found. Um, they're also at that site horse bones 
signs of butchering, as well as big cats too. So I don't know if they were using this to hunt or for like defense against predators, or both. Um, but uh, these pre-modern humans um, also probably had controlled use of fire, like Homo erectus as well. And so these pre-modern humans are pretty important because the idea is, is that Homo erectus is ancestral to pre-modern humans, and then pre-modern humans are ancestral to us, but also to our closest cousins, Neanderthals, as well as the Denisovans. I've heard about the Denisovans, been in the news a lot uh, recently, which we'll see here in a second. Uh, Neanderthals, <laughs> that's not a great picture, from the, the Neanderthal Museum in Germany. They're a lot like us too, um, but you can see they do have larger faces, larger brow edges, a larger nose, that receding chin that we just saw for pre-modern humans in general, um, a forehead that kind of recedes back instead of being high and vertical like our own. Um, in terms of their cranial capacities, they were huge. On average in the 1500s, that's bigger than modern humans today. Does that mean they were smarter? Not necessarily. Um, they were, in terms of their body size, shorter and stockier than modern humans, and probably really muscular, really um, relied on strength in their life and had active lifestyles. And so some people <coughs> argue that all that extra brain tissue was probably important in terms of controlling all of those muscles that, that they had. Um, so really large cranial capacities, short and stocky bodies, five, five and a half feet tall, um, and um, when it comes to the classic Neanderthals, probably specialized for cold environments. Uh, we also see uh, more sophisticated tools, good for cutting and chiseling. Um, they're referred to as mysterian tools that you see down here. Uh, Neanderthals probably rely on hunting, um, more so maybe even than previous species, because of the environments that they were living in. Cold environments, how many plants are available? And so probably hunting with spears, maybe hafting points to, to spears, but they don't have long distance weaponry. So they had to get up close and personal with these large animals that they were hunting. And we see signs of injuries from that hunting behavior in Neanderthal fossils uh, as well. So the Neanderthals were around, I keep pushing the date back for Neanderthals too, um, 250,000 years ago, at least some people want to push it back even to 400,000 years ago. You know, the, the problem is, is like, at what point do you pick? Um, when, it, when it's a continuum, you know, when is this a Neanderthal and not Homo heidelbergensis? When it's a continuum, it's pretty tough and it's often subjective. Um, so Neanderthals um, are one of the descendants of these pre-modern humans. You know, okay, we have sports, but in terms of brute survival, is there any advantage to long legs? You know, you could run faster from a predator, but you know, what's the advantage of, of long legs? So I think in terms of stride length and energetic efficiency, too. Okay. Um, it turns out that bipedalism, I didn't mention this before, but bipedalism is, um, at least walking, not running, but walking bipedally is more energetically efficient than walking quadrupedally. And so if you have the elongation of the lower limbs, that is part of that, right, in terms of the stride length. About the so you don't work off so many calories, and mm -hmm. so you don't you have to eat so much. Yeah, which would have been an issue for Neanderthals. Yeah, they don't have enough food. Right, and they're living in cold environments where the problem is um, not just retain, trying to retain heat, um, but generate heat, which that costs energy. Okay. So yeah, so it, life is probably pretty tough. For I heard another thing with the advantages of bipedalism, having your vision higher up, so you can see further. Yeah, so you can see uh, potential the predators grass. or prey. Or the high grass. <laughs> yeah, visual surveillance. Yeah, exactly. And um, so the Neanderthal and the pre-modern humans were finding everywhere, like homo Oh, practice. thank you for bringing that up. No, not Neanderthals. Pre-modern humans, yes. We see in Africa, in Asia, and in Europe. Neanderthals are more restricted to Europe, um, the Middle East, and Central Asia. So they are more of a restricted range than what we've talked about for Homo erectus or pre-modern humans. And um, our other cousins, the Denisovans, um, overlap a bit in terms of geographic space with the Neanderthals. But the idea is, is that 
humans and Denisovans and Neanderthals were descendants of, of pre-modern humans and yet probably diverging from each other 500 to maybe 800,000 years ago. Our lineages were diverging. So the Denisovans, notice there are no pictures, <laughs> um, because we really have limited fossils for this group. We've got a couple of teeth, We've got a finger bone, and then we have a bone, uh, a fragment of a limb bone um, that probably, and maybe a jaw bone that belongs to the Denisovans. And first found in this cave in, in uh, Russia, in Siberia, the Denisovan cave in, in Russia. Um, but <coughs> what scientists were able to do is extract DNA from these fossils. And so we know the Denisovan genome, <laughs> but we don't know what they look like. Um, and so we've been able to compare that genome with the Neanderthal genome and the modern human genome. And scientists have argued this is a substantially different group than the Neanderthals or um, modern humans. Um, and when it comes to the Deducemans, Neanderthals, and modern humans, although they may have been diverging 500 to 800,000 years ago, they were coexisting for thousands of years in some cases, in some areas of the world. And so Denisovans may have been around as much as 400,000 years ago too, up until maybe 40,000 years ago. And we have increasing evidence that the Denisovans were interbreeding, not just interacting, but interbreeding with modern humans. Um, and that's what you're seeing in this map here. So modern humans and Denisovans on multiple occasions, right? And so that's why um, modern humans today, um, many modern humans have Denisovan DNA maybe one to four percent, depending on the part of the world that we're looking at, but that also Neanderthals and Denisovans were interbreeding too. Um, that fragment of the limb bone I just mentioned a second ago, uh, DNA was ex extracted and it looks like um, that fragment of bone came from a girl who had a Neanderthal mom and a Denisovan dad. Yeah. So more research is showing more evidence of this interbreeding, this admixture between Denisovans, Neanderthals, and modern humans. Because on the modern human and Neanderthal side, there's evidence of interbreeding too. So here, if we, we move west, right, we see these sites um, where there was interaction, coexistence, and interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans too. Neanderthals and modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans, Denisovans and modern humans are all interbreeding. So can we assume that it was a peaceful world? <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> we, don't need peace. we don't need peace for interbreeding to happen, right? Unfortunately, um, we know that. Um, so, so it's hard to say exactly what that coexistence looks like. Um, and in some cases, archaeologists have argued that they were also sharing tool technologies, too, or borrowing or copying as well. But it's hard to say. Um, you know, you saw that picture, though. We're not talking about probably um, these groups that look that different yeah. from one another, but who knows socially how different they were, or cognitively how, how different they were. Do Only you have it. any research about the values, like was there any emergence of sentimentality, you know, I mean, or total individualism? The guy or the woman looked out completely for themselves, so do they care about the kids, do they care about the ones they made with? Is there any evidence of values? There is evidence of caregiving for like maybe the elderly or people with um, certain kinds of health conditions. Um, so for among the Neanderthals, one of the important things that I forgot to mention is that we see symbolic expression. Um, there's jewelry, for instance, made out of shells, maybe painted shells, as well as um, eagle talons too, um, and other kinds of symbolic expression. And we also see intentional burial of the dead, associated with the Neanderthals over 100,000 years ago, which makes it easier for paleoanthropologists and archeologists in terms of preservation is so rare of these fossils, right? So to cover them up, increase the chances of preservation. Uh, and so when it comes to some of the individuals for Neanderthals, we have noticed that um, there are, they're often referred to as like old man um, from a site in France or a site in uh, the Middle East. Um, individuals who are probably in their 40s, maybe 50, but in one case, an individual who suffered some kind of trauma to the legs, um, to um, one side of the body in terms of the arm, um, was probably blind and 
and recent research has also suggested death as well. And so the idea is how in the world did this individual survive unless others were taking care of him? Um, and so there is evidence of that that's associated with Neanderthals. Actually, it goes back even further at the site Homo erectus. There is not this one, but uh, another pretty complete cranium that's missing. It doesn't have, I think, maybe a couple teeth. Um, and, and there's resorption of the jawbone, too. So this individual probably was toothless for a long time before he died. And so, it's, so the idea is, is that you know, perhaps someone was taking care of that individual. Um, so we do have evidence like that. And then in terms of burials, also, um, it's not just individuals who are buried, but there are some of these great goods animal bones and tools and things like that that are included in those burials too. So certainly there's evidence of um, increasing cognitive abilities and perhaps sociality. Was there any, was there any investment in, in the young or do they just assume the young is going to, the probability is the young is going to die? I think the assumption is, is that there was a lot of investment in the young because that's what we see in primates in general. Primates and particularly primate mothers invest a lot of time and energy in making sure that their offspring survive. Okay. Um, and so I think that you know that's not just humans, but we see it in the great apes, in chimpanzees, in gorillas, in bonobos. And I think that the idea is that it would have been the same for Neanderthals or else these infants and children would never have survived. Okay, do you see any evidence back then of neuron mere neurons? I don't know. I'm not sure. Because that's very sophisticated. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's looked at that. OK, thank you. How far back can they extract DNA? Well, that's the problem. <laughs> uh, we've gotten better at it over time. Or I should say we, it's not me. Um, <laughs> scientists have gotten better at it over time. And they pushed it back farther and farther. So um, for instance, they've been able to, there's a site in Spain it's called uh, uh, Cima de los Huesos, pit of bones, uh, because there are these pre-modern humans who it looks like were dumping um, uh, bodies of individuals down a pit. And there's, um, they've been able to, in that site dates back maybe 400,000 years ago. And so far, I think that's the oldest um, that they've been successful. And um, actually from that site, they found that um, some similarities in common with Neanderthals that suggest that that particular population of pre-modern humans may have been ancestral. Neanderthals. But I think that's the earliest um, that we've been able to go back. But hopefully it will get better over time. But at some point, you know, if you're going back, the, our, our process is like actually mostly stone. Yeah, there's a lot of places of tissue. So that, and that's an issue. Um, sometimes researchers are finding ways to get around that. So um, also looking at proteins, like looking at collagen. So maybe they can't extract DNA, but they can look at the actual proteins, the kind of collagen they find in one fossil, and be able to associate that then with Denisovans versus Neanderthals versus humans. We have different genes that code for proteins that are a little bit different. And so that protein analysis has been another <laughs> scientific re revolution in terms about, of, of learning about these, these fossils and analyzing them. Yeah. Is there any way to substantiate when cannibalism <laughs> and also possibly among some modern, uh, or pre-modern, excuse me, obviously modern humans, but pre-modern humans, uh, there's a skull from Africa, the Bodo site in Africa, that um, shows, it has stone tool marks on it, and so it was defleshed. We don't know why um, it was defleshed, but it's interesting behavior. Um, also for, you said the skull was and also from the Neanderthals, there are a couple of sites where it looks like one group of Neanderthals uh, killed, butchered, presumably ate another group of Neanderthals, butchering them just like they would you know, other animals, um, smashing bones to get to the bone marrow and everything. Um, so there is evidence of that, but I don't know what. But there would be a transition from vegetarianism oh. to meat eating, right? But that's much earlier. That, that was way back. Yeah, so the idea is is that, well, the australopiths were eating some meat. Not, not necessarily big animals, but insects and maybe small animals. And that the idea is, is over the, especially of our genus, that, that meat eating increased. Yeah. 
Sorry to open that door. Yeah, there's still <laughs> 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 there was a president. We can see evidence of intentional burying of the dead. Mm -hmm. But do we know why? No. Like, did it have some kind of ritual significance? We don't know. Was it just a way to get rid of a body? Because they stink. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with the pit of the boat. Like, why did they put throw all of these? Or they died from potential disease and buried the disease or, you know, bury the hurt of not being with the person. Right. Because of them being compassion or development, then they probably feel lost. Right. Yeah. So we don't know about the meaning. Um, or if these were rituals, or like for the Neanderthals, we often find uh, those individuals buried in a flexed position, so their legs are up and close to their body. We don't know if that had some kind of significance, or it was like, well, maybe you dig a smaller hole that way. Right? <laughs> we don't know if it's this practical or ritual or a mixture of both. Or that's how they died. <laughs> was it, was a, a lot of them were buried that way. Was the grave shallow? Um, Relatively shallow. Yeah, because yes. that's a lot of energy to, to do. Yeah, yeah. So there was a, um, some skeletons found. Uh, I can't remember. I don't know if you've heard of this. It was a couple of hundred thousand years ago, I guess. And they found that they thought at first that it was all one skeleton, and then they found that they were like taking pieces away and adding other skeletons. Ooh, I don't. But they were, um, so they they buried in, individuals, but then like exhumed parts of it. It was the it was two skeletons in particular that they were basically they found. They thought it was a, a boy and a girl, I believe. And the more they looked at it, the more they realized like it was the the femur of like an adult male and the the, the radius of like a ten year old girl or something like that. It was just like different pieces that they. They say they don't really know why they did it, but it was it was being done over a very long period of time, like hundreds of years. So and and we think this was about two hundred thousand years ago. I have to look it up. Okay. For the actual date, but I'll yeah, yeah, I would be interested in see that. <laughs> okay, so I guess we're to us now. <laughs> Zoom seven million years. <laughs> um, so in the time of the modern human, so the idea is is that um, we are descendants of. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> we are descendants of um, the pre-modern humans, like Homo heidelbergensis. Uh, as far as when that point again, that point, where do we say we actually have anatomically modern Homo sapiens sapiens? Um, Paleoanthropologists often disagree about that. I'd say most people agree that we definitely have anatomically modern humans by at least 200,000 years ago. Um, there, there's another um, a, a site in Morocco that suggests maybe even further back, 300,000 years ago. Not fully accepted by, by everyone because it's like, well, how round does the skull have to be? Um, how pointy does the chin have to be before we say this is us, this is, this is our modern humans? Um, but our oldest fossils that I think most paleoanthropologists agree on come from East Africa and date to about 200,000 years ago. Um, so this figure over here points out some differences in our uh, skulls compared to Neanderthals. So if you notice just the general shape of our skulls, they're much more rounded, like globe-shaped, whereas Neanderthals are longer and lower. We both have pretty big cranial capacities, but um, probably the earliest anatomically modern humans had even larger cranial capacities, more like Neanderthals than we do today. The cranial capacities actually decreased uh, over time. Uh, we have smaller brow ridges too, except for some of these really old modern humans had a little bit bigger brow ridges. There's variation among modern humans today in terms of our brow ridges, right? Um, but, but generally smaller than Neanderthals, we have a, more, a higher forehead, a more vertical forehead as well. Um, we had uh, we both have noses, but in terms of uh, the size of our noses, Neanderthals have huge noses. You can see that like the, uh, the nasal bones there almost project out straight, right? You can imagine um, the nose made up mostly of cartilage, how large it would be. Okay, so that nasal bone projected smaller noses than the Neanderthals did. Um, we also have this cheekbone angulation, this uh, sort of dip. It actually gives us more control over our facial uh, muscles, which means we can 
communicate non-verbally, perhaps more elaborately than uh, Neanderthals did. Um, we also have a smaller jaw and teeth, and um, we have pointy chins as compared to Neanderthals, where their chins kind of recede rather than, than point out. The back of our skulls are different too, more rounded, and that um, occipital bun that I mentioned earlier, that bulge that we see in most Neanderthals is absent in uh, most modern humans. Um, you know, as far as this variation, I mean, it's striking in that, but um, it's really not that much. Like, if we could, could see well, all of the Neanderthal fossils, all of the modern human fossils, there's a lot of overlap here in terms of uh, our skulls. Um, is below the skull, though, humans um, are taller with more lightly built skeletons, so maybe 4 to 12 inches taller than Neanderthals were. Um, as far as these anatomically modern humans, the classic model was that they evolved first in Africa. Like, there's this new species that evolves in Africa, and this group then migrates out into different parts of the world and replaces all the other hominins that were living in these you know, places in Southeast Asia and in Europe, whether it's Homo erectus or pre-modern humans, that they all get replaced. Um, that view is changing. We just talked about the, the admixture, for instance, that, that um, genetics has found, but um, it looks like it's much more complicated in terms of the movement of modern humans, that, that they're moving around Africa, they're moving out, they're moving back in, that there are these different populations um, that some that show more modern features than others. And so it's not the simple one way out and replacement. Um, that in fact, when these populations were moving around, there was also interbreeding going on as well. So that's really a, a changing view of how kind of we took over the world. Why is it that there's just one hominin species around today when for most of human evolution, there's that coexistence that we've been, been seeing over time. Uh, and so uh, I think this figure down here is really helpful in terms of thinking about human evolution. So um, Homo erectus, which we talked about here, is kind of, at least at the base of this, we put Homo habilis down there even further, right, in time. Um, Homo erectus then is, is ancestral to pre-modern humans, like Homo heidelbergensis. And then Homo heidelbergensis is ancestral to not just us, but Neanderthals and Denisovans, but notice how these lineages that diverge come back, right? That is because of the gene flow, that admixture, that interbreeding that we've been finding. So they can be separated for thousands of years, and yet not different enough that we can't mate and produce viable and fertile offspring. And so you know, this, this picture has become much more complicated over time. Um, as far as, as modern humans, we also expand our geographic range beyond other species into Australia, eventually into the Americas as well, and um, develop more sophisticated tools too. Um, the focus in, in terms of anatomically modern humans is, is, tends to be on small blade tools and chisel-like tools, um, but eventually we start to develop things like the spear thrower, the atlatl, that long distance weaponry, so we don't have to hunt animals up close and personal like the Neanderthals did. Um, also, uh, barbed harpoons for marine resources and needles to sew clothing and embellish them with beads. Um, we start to see um, more sophisticated tools made from a variety of materials and even more symbolic expression than what we would associate with the Neanderthals. Um, so, uh, burial of the dead, um, more elaborate grave goods buried with the dead, um, Jewelry and figurines and, and art on cave walls, those are associated with, with humans, especially in the Upper Paleolithic, about 40,000 years ago. There's almost like this explosion of art. And um, what paleoanthropologists have suggested is that we're not just anatomically modern, um, we're cognitively modern at that point um, as well. You mentioned Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so, how, how old are the skeletons? So, um, the, as far as like when did humans make it to yeah. Australia? Probably the archaeological evidence is a little bit earlier than the skeletal evidence. Um, so, in other words, we're not finding necessarily remains, but we're finding artifacts and other things that date back 55, maybe 60,000 years ago. Any like modes of transportation? Yeah. So, how in the world did people get to Australia is the question, right? So, sea levels may have been different. Um, and so, but still, the idea is, is they couldn't have 
just walked there. Um, they must have rafted there. So there must have been some sort of um, boating technology that rafts, you know, simple kinds of ways that um, these early modern humans were traveling that area of the world, which is, you know, interesting in terms of complex behavior. Right, because again, you kind of have to take a leap of faith that you're going somewhere, yeah. you're just getting on a raft. So you can yeah. see Australia well, I don't know about that because you would have some island hopping if the, yes. if the, the seas go down, mm -hmm. then you can see where you're going next time. She's so getting around, you know, there's a, something hanging out there, maybe we can kill a meter or something. Yeah, know, Which brings so. you're fishing, and oh, look. Yeah. Not, <laughs> that brings me to a question. Are there um, areas that are like below sea level or, um, you know, completely covered with ice that have not been explored archaeologically yes. that may actually present more evidence yes. to broaden or tighten up some of the, the science. Yes, that's the assumption. Okay, for sure. And there are underwater archaeologists, maybe they'll start to explore those, <laughs> those sites, so, but that's an issue. Um, I, I did the 23andMe oh, okay. uh, DNA thing, and one of the things that they talk about is um, your, your haplogroups. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps identify the migrations. Do you put much stock in this, in, in their interpretations? I mean, this gives me a, a map, supposedly, of, you know, from my haplogroup of how it, you know, how people would have moved, moved. I mean, you know, it's really hard, I think, for scientists to. to comment on like how accurate is this, how much stock should I put on this, um, in this, because we don't know exactly how would they estimate ancestry, because that's like protected, I mean they're a company, <laughs> it's protected information, so this isn't something that's like peer reviewed by scientists, which is problematic, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, so I think that, especially anthropologists have been critical um, of, those kinds of results, like are they really meaningful? Well, I think it's like, are they personally meaningful to you? Or what do you want to use those for? But also kind of be skeptical, because we don't know um, all there is to know about even modern human genetic variation. And certainly there are underrepresented groups um, in their database and um, potential issues, like what, what what are they focusing? What, what genetic traits are they actually focusing on? Um, you know, you could you could take the test, and your um, sibling could take the test. You have the same ancestors, presumably, right? right? And yet get different results. So I would say, give it a grain of salt. Um, and follow along with the research, though, the scientific research in terms of the, you know, those haplogroups groups and how meaningful they are. Yeah, there was there was a project several years ago because uh, they had it on Nova, I think it was. This uh, person went across Asia and did blood tests and did genetic testing to see and found out how related everybody was as they went across yeah. to Siberia. So, I mean, there's some stock in it, but like you said, how they came up with that, we don't know yet, so. Yes. Well, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but where, where are you? Are your group looking at the new, the the changes now in gen, in in traits? Yeah, where do you see the, the tr changes going on? I mean, obviously people are a heck of a lot taller, mm -hmm. you know. But where else do you see traits evolving? Well, um, a lot of the biological changes that we see aren't necessarily genetic; um, they're a result of our modern lifestyles that are very different than the lifestyles that we've had for most of our evolutionary oh, history. Okay, okay. That doesn't mean that genetic changes aren't happening uh, within and between populations, but I'd say another trend is that, just like with the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and the modern humans, there's a lot of gene flow that's always characterized our species, but it's easier now, thanks to our technology, than ever before to find you know, your mate from across the world, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what that means is if there's more gene flow, that means that human populations, um, the, any differences that are there, which we're not a very variable species when it comes to our genetics, we're like 99.9% the same as any other modern human. But any of those little differences that are there are perhaps breaking down because of all of this mixture between populations. So do anthropologists uh, 
sort of project. And since every species becomes evolves, every species eventually becomes extinct. <laughs> you know, there are people in America who think that uh, humans are the top of the yeah. heap and, and, and will always be the top of the heap. So do anthropologists sort of sit around and say, well, what will the future look like? What will be the next group? You know, because humans may not be, unless we destroy the earth. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's what I think that's a big concern in anthropology. Do anthropologists do that? I, I think yes, um, and you know, especially in terms of because a lot of anthropologists have focused on how humans we don't just like adapt to the environments that we live in; we modify the environments, and so um, but then we have to respond to those modifications that we've created. So the question for anthropologists is, can we do that? Yeah. Like what? How much adaptability do we have as a species? Um, can we respond to these problems that, in a lot of cases, we've created? Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, like, that's something that anthropologists are, are interested in and, and worried about in terms of and our future. We're playing around with people's DNA, and and you know, who knows what what, what the future holds? Yeah. Who is yeah. that thing about the Anthropocene that this is actually the era of the Anthropocene that we are sort of locked in? Yeah. Uh, control and everything, I mean, ourselves and the way we're, you know, the, 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 the impact is so strong from what we've done that uh, we, we can do anything about what we've done. Right. You know, some other have we reached the point of yeah, that we've done ourselves in? I mean, have we created an environment that we can adapt to? I, 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 I mean, these are the questions. I have a question. Little Slani, your, your uh, references are the stringer. And, uh, I got my degree at the University of Other Beatrice and back in seven. Oh, okay. Okay. And Stringer was just an up and coming movie yeah. at the time, okay? And there was that big controversy between Wolf Wolf and uh -huh. actually Grace was the big guy back then. Yeah. And and, and about the multi regional and then the, uh -huh. the, the lumpers as they call them, you know. And then the the Rebecca Kahn mm -hmm. Stringer. Is she still with the is he, He's loosened up. I mean this figure comes right. from him. Because <laughs> that was the two that was the that was the uh, out of Africa thing, uh -huh. and then you had the multi-regional thing, and there was a big fight between there. So yes. the Stringer evidently is... He's big. loosened up from that, that total replacement model um, because of all the evidence for gene flow, right? That that, that total out of Africa replacement model, I mean, um, it, ha it has to allow for some admixture between these groups based on our... But, on our but I just have said that, that out of Africa the thing was based on Rebecca Khan's uh, thing coming out of the computer uh, mm -hmm. DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, yeah, but, yeah, and then and, 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 and Wolf up and Grace said we're sticking with the fossils. Yeah, and they were actually came around and supported them. <laughs> yeah, later yes. on. Yeah. <laughs> later on. So they got that straightened out between the genetics and the, and the fossils. Then, so basically, now instead of the having these two competing models, where it's the total replacement out of Africa model or the multi-regional regional continuity model. There's this like middle ground, so all of the evidence makes sense with this middle ground, right? So the argument is, is that there, a population in, out of Africa has made the largest contribution to, as far as like human, the human gene pool, modern human gene pool today, <coughs> um, but some of these other groups like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans have contributed to the modern human gene pool. So they, they call that the partial <laughs> replacement <laughs> model. Yeah, it's just the middle ground model um, between both of them. But we'll see over time what happens. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were these two camps that didn't want to compromise. Them. Right, it, didn't, it was a pretty big fight. Yeah. Control. Yeah, and that's, that's still something that's that debated and, and discussed in terms of how much gene flow, you know, as well. Yeah. Has anthropology discovered something called a time warp? Where, 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 where the population would have been static and never migrated to any other place. Speaking of in terms of animals, like really close to the coast of Africa, Madagascar, where there's animals there that just don't seem to exist anywhere else. Were there humanoids that were there? Has that been looked at? Or? I mean, maybe um, that can help us to explain some, uh, like Homo floresiensis, right? So this. Um, population that doesn't quite fit you know what we know about other species where there are these isolated populations that were different a mix of traits that we don't mm -hmm. you know, that's hard to figure out their ancestry mm -hmm. um, so maybe uh, with respect to some of those populations, and I'll talk about another one actually in a second <laughs> I want to ask you you know 
it's supposedly, you know, you talked of some species uh, went extinct. Supposedly negative genetic traits, you know, will go extinct. And alcoholism has it, and I perceive it as a genetic trait. Now, are there good, uh, is there something good in that gene that keeps it going? I mean, I don't understand why alcoholism, it's from, it's from ancient times, and it's still here, and it's still, you know, very perilous, but it's, it's, it's still here, and it's dominant. I don't know really that genetic basis. I don't, I don't know you're that not, research well, about the genetic I, I, basis. That's my speculation, that there is a genetic component to alcoholism. If, I, and if there is, yeah. I think what I would say is that um, we, we can't just look at it as biological, that, that like so many other human problems, it's biocultural, it's biosocial, right? We have to think about um, the social effects too. Because we do plenty of things that aren't adaptive, right? As individuals and as, as societies. Okay. Um, and so the idea is, is that hopefully you weed those things out over time, but it's not necessarily the case. I, I, in relation to this, you know, about how much power do the genes really have ultimately? I mean, you know, does that, does that, how much flexibility is there in the system, I guess you could say, you know, or how much is everything determined by genes? Mm -hmm. There's a, 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 a guy who is an ornithologist from, uh, I think, somewhere. Uh, from New York somewhere. <laughs> anyway, uh, he wrote this book called uh, The Evolution of Beauty. And he talks about uh, the Darwin's thing uh, that we keep kind of left out. You know, we talk about natural selection, but there's also this thing about sexual selection. How does sexual selection happen? Like, uh, maybe there's no accounting for beauty. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's, uh, you can't account for taste sometimes, you know? So in those, in those places where you have birds, especially when the gals are picking the nest to go through, you know, they go from one nest to the other day, the male one, you know, decorates it, you know, and, and you can't tell which one the, the, the female's going to pick, she just picks one. Now it's because her eye caught that, you know, is there a genetic predisposition to there, you know, it's going to make her pick that, or she goes, well, I like that, you know, and she goes there. There's always there's that little flexibility in there that this guy is saying from, uh, from uh, New Jersey or New York, wherever the guy's from, uh, that uh, there's a flexibility in there that comes with the sexual selection that we can't account for. <coughs> uh, it's not dictated genetically. What it is, it's just some kind of a, I'm gonna say, flexibility in the, yeah. in the system somehow. I'd say that that flexibility char characterized not just us, but our order, the primate order in general, in terms of behavioral flexibility, um, our reliance on learning, it's not, most behavior is not instinctual in primates. And so, and that, that, that's extra true for, for humans too. And so if we're thinking about like, how much do our genetics control? What I would say is that, think about um, the fact that there's so little genetic variation in our species, and yet how much variation is present in um, our societies, you know, culturally. There's so much variation, even bio biologically, that doesn't have a genetic basis, but it's a result of the kinds of environments that we grow up in, we develop, we live in. Um, that we have that flexibility, um, and that that's what's made us successful, that we, our genes haven't specialized us for one kind of environment, right? In fact, we're flexible and we're able to live just about everywhere um, in the world because uh, we can uh, innovate um, new technology, because we have cultures where we can um, develop knowledge and pass it on through, oh, language. We didn't mention language as a hallmark of humanity earlier. We can pass it on through our language over time. We go through the skulls over here. You know, one goes to, I like the shape of that person's skull, that, that whatever that creature, I like that skull, you know? And so they go as they get along, you know? And then mm -hmm. they get to some, you know, I mean, it's like that better of, something catches the eye there. Mm -hmm. You can't explain why that catches the eye. Um, you only have a couple slides left, right? Yeah. Okay, so I, I just checked, because we only have the room reserved until 3, but I wanted to check to see if they have somebody coming in at 3. It is reserved again at 3.30, so okay. um, <clears throat> I think a lot of us have a lot of questions and want to talk, but maybe we can at least make sure you are able to get done okay. with your presentation, and then, then go back. we can... I can always yeah, go back yeah. to yeah. other slides, too. Okay. Um, so, recent discoveries, then. So the one that, that Doug mentioned earlier about Australopithecus anamensis. So as I mentioned, that Australopith group, anamensis, is the earliest Australopith. 
um, about 4.2 million years ago for the, the oldest fossils. Uh, so this would be one of the gracile, the lightly built australopiths. And um, before this new research came out in August, um, we didn't know what Australopithecus animensis looked like. So we had various bones, but we didn't have a skull. And so now we do. Um, a skull probably belonging to a male cranial capacity, I think it's around 370, so small cranial capacity. Um, but we, basically this gives us a chance to look at features that we didn't know about. And uh, traditionally the view is that Australopithecus animensis is ancestral to Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis. Um, so Lucy is another one of those gracile Australopiths. Um, and so there are similarities in common that, that suggest that that's still the case, um, but also some of the, the other traits in the skull suggest that perhaps animensis was ancestral not just to Lucy, but other Australopiths too. Um, a South African form, I think I had a picture earlier, um, Australopithecus africanus. So perhaps animensis is this important uh, root species with the Australopiths. Another in interesting thing about the spine, so this dates the skull dates to 3.8 million years ago. And so what the researchers argue is that if this frontal bone that was found, I think, in the 1980s belongs to Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis, um, that would mean that animensis and afarensis actually coexisted in time because this frontal bone has dated back to 3.9 million years ago. So maybe there's this 100,000 year overlap between animensis and afarensis. So why does that matter? Well, it matters in terms of how we think about evolution. So the traditional idea is that there was this linear evolution from Australopithecus animensis to afarensis. So like animensis changed, all the animensis populations change over time and eventually look different enough that we call them a different species, Australopithecus afarensis. But what this new research suggests that um, instead of this linear evolution, that there was branching evolution happening. And so that there were different populations of, of Australopithecus animensis. One population perhaps was isolated and changed over time, and that population gave rise to Lucy species, Afarensis, but then there were other populations of animensis that were still around for at least 100,000 years. So we've got branching rather than a straight linear progression from animensis to afarensis. And that's pretty interesting in terms of how we think about evolutionary change and uh, speciation for that matter. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty interesting recent discovery. I also wanted to mention this uh, research that was published in, in April of this year. Uh, 13 bones and teeth from two adults and one child were found in a cave in the Philippines. Um, and we have another really small, unexpected species, three to four feet tall, dating 50 to 67,000 years ago. So again, there's this overlap. It's pretty recent, right, to have um, this hominin three to four feet tall with a, a very interesting mix of traits. We, again, don't know exactly what to do yet with this new species because we see some traits that are very much like Homo erectus, we see other traits that are more like us, pretty modern, and then there are Australopith traits in there too. And so this interesting mix of traits makes um, trying to figure out ancestry really difficult. So again, is Homo erectus the ancestor of this new species in the Philippines? Or was there another species, maybe even before Homo erectus, that made it out of Africa that's ancestral? We don't know yet. <laughs> but the picture gets more and more complicated. And I have the, the citations there in case you want to read more about them. But so what does all of this mean for how we see human evolution? Um, and so kind of getting to this point of uh, how our models are changing over time and the way that we conceptualize human evolution. We've all probably seen this before, right? This is the traditional view of, of human evolution. And it's very much a linear progression, right? We've got these um, ape-like creatures on this end and this march towards progress humans, the pinnacle of <laughs> hominid evolution, right, at the end there. So linear evolution, and also we're just seeing this one line. Every hominid is a part of that line, is, is, uh, is um, you know, a link in that chain. And um, basically what we're seeing though is that there's a lot more variation, there are a lot more species than we ever anticipated. That this really does not represent 
hominin evolution, that really it's more like a tree or a bush with lots of branches that intertwine and yet lots of dead ends too. Right? Like that new species in the Philippines probably, like those robust australopiths, the Paranthropus genus that we were talking about earlier. Still other anthropologists today have said that it's not like a tree either because we have to take into consideration the possibility of admixture. Like we have been talking about with the Neanderthals and the Jesuits and modern humans, we're able to see that because we can extract DNA and compare it. Um, you know, we talked a second ago about how that's hard, the older the fossils get, the harder that gets. But if that's happening in recent stages of, of hominid evolution, why hasn't it been happening throughout hominid evolution? And so what they say is that perhaps we should need to think about uh, human evolution as more of a basket weave or a braided stream my picture right here, right? Where we have these different lines that are evolving over time with lineages that diverge, move away, right? But then come back. And so they can be diverge for thousands of years and not be so different that they can't mate and produce viable and fertile offspring. And so if you think about this with like Neanderthals and modern humans, um, traditionally there was this view when we knew very little about uh, Neanderthal evolution, were the Neanderthals ancestral to our species? Were they our ancestors? Um, we know today that they weren't, right? That we're cousins. Um, but we also know that although Neanderthals weren't ancestral to our species, they were some of our ancestors, right? That they have contributed to the modern human gene pool. Not just Neanderthals, but how many of these other groups over time? It's not this linear progression at all. It's much more complicated, and I would argue much more fascinating. And if I could just give a suggestion, this is a great, um, short, easy to read article about uh, scientific discoveries um, focused on human origins from the Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, actually, those two recent discoveries that I mentioned are on that list. There are others that are pretty interesting, too. Yeah. So, you talked about uh, basically procreating and creating fertile offspring. Were there situations where they didn't create, where they procreated and they didn't create? Maybe. Oh, Maybe. Well, we don't know that. Yeah, so, so there have been suggestions um, that, that certain kinds of pairings may have been more difficult um, in terms of like who mother was and who father was. Um, and thinking about um, difficulties like how in the world would a, a human female manage birthing a Neanderthal? Um, so yes, there could have been um, difficulties. They might have been rare, and possible but rare in some cases too. Um, and so we, we don't know exactly all of that information, but that certainly is a suggestion. That, um, when we think about those diverging lines, it may have been easier or harder in some cases to kind of come back and, and contribute. So, um, I, I've been writing down questions, and, and some I've already asked, but um, a, a, what I think is going to be a quick question. I know um, four years ago, there wasn't really a way to extract DNA from cremains. Do you know if there's been any progress made on that? I'm not sure. Because both that. of my parents are deceased, mm -hmm. and so I can't do, and I don't have much contact with my family. Um, so, I, you know, I'm or miss kind of things, but I, I am interested in being able to do that. Yeah. And I do have my mom's remains, so I was wondering if there's been any progress on that. Not that I've heard of, but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been any progress. Okay. Um, so one of you guys asked about if there's, like, um, if, if anthropologists sit around and talk about what the future of evolution yeah. might look like. There, I, I've worked with kids with and adults with autism for, for the last 10 years. And um, one of the speculations is that autism may be part of an evolutionary change. Of course, we're not going to like wake up one day and everybody's linked in with te technology, but um, one of the things that, they, that has been discussed is people with um, autism have a more difficult time interacting with 
other people, but they interact fantastically with technology. Mm -hmm. And they pick up on things very quickly. And you know, when you when you modify a learning environment and a testing environment, and and the tools that are used to make assessments there, they, it's been found that actually the level of cognitive ability is much higher than ever anticipated, and sometimes much higher than that of the average person. Um, so do you know? I, I've always wondered if. Uh, Anthropologists or other scientists, you know, where they sit uh, with that. Do they think that 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 our our evolution, our, our next evolutionary phase, will incorporate some technology in, you know, as far as interacting with technology? Yeah, I think that um, certainly they would expect social changes, right? Or, um, but as far as genetic changes. Um, that would require that there's differential survival and reproductive success. So individuals with genetic traits that were beneficial in a technological environment would have to basically produce more offspring than people that don't, right? For that trait to increase in time. Um, so the question is, you know, the variation that we see with regard to any trait, um, does that really affect our ability to survive and produce offspring? Do we produce more offspring relative to people who don't have that? And so I guess if that condition was met, there is a possibility for that kind of change over time um, to occur. I think what, what anthropologists would also say about genetic variation is that um, it means different things in different times, right? And the social context is important. So we can also have these traits that are um, perhaps adaptive or neutral in some situations, but considered, socially considered, or socially defined as problematic. Right? And so there again is that, what I think is so fascinating about studying humans, we have to constantly think about how biology and culture are interacting. The whole model. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about, you said you got your PhD in? In anthropology. But you said basically. Yeah, so um, my, my dissertation focused on maternal health and reproduction in Honduras, actually with an indigenous group in, in Honduras called the Mosquito People. And so my interest was very much um, related to how women in um, a pretty marginal environment manage to have large families um, and raise their offspring with few resources. And um, by large, I mean, women on average had eight live births in, in their lifetime, so many more than that, um, but had very little access to uh, like emergency obstetric care. So what did that mean for women in terms of their, um, the, the morbidity they experience, more mortality they experience, but then I was also interested in, in health across their um, life course too. Um, and so to study something like that, there's a lot of biology in there, but then there's a lot of culture as well. And so like what I found is that risk for mortality were highest among young women. And um, that makes sense for biological reasons in terms of a lot of times these young women were still growing and developing, right, when they, they experienced their first pregnancy. But also socially I could make sense of it because um, young women had much lower social status. They had um, really limited abilities to make decisions about like healthcare, like, um, can I convince my family to spend the money to get me to a health center or a hospital to give birth? Probably not. Compared to an, an older woman who did have higher status in her household and can control more resources. So for me, that biocultural perspective is very important in, in my research. I also found, for instance, that um, sometimes women um, didn't go to hospitals to give birth because they wanted to draw on different kinds of healthcare during pregnancy and childbirth, so not just like modern Western medicine, but also on traditional medicine. So um, in the cases of maternal mortality that I recorded, about one third of them, um, family members or friends said the ultimate cause of the woman's death was uh, sorcery. Um, and so there were these, this idea that um, these supernatural causes uh, were responsible for, for instance, severe bleeding 
that then led to a woman's death. And so um, the local ideas were that you know Western medicine could help with the bleeding, but first you gotta get you have to address the sorcery. Um, so you need a traditional healer there, and you need a nurse and a doctor. And so that wasn't necessarily available to them at a hospital, whereas maybe it was in their communities. Um, so these kind of complex interactions are really important, um, not just for under like academically understanding these issues, but practically too, right? In terms of trying to come up with um, actual, actual solutions to address women's health needs and these um, particularly marginalized populations. Okay, this was it. Did, did, did you have the privilege of living there with them for interacting with them on a yeah, regular basis? For a year. For a year, cool. Yeah. Okay. What time frame was that that you did your research? Um, in 2005. Oh, was when I, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, I have, have kept in touch with, although this is a, a place where there isn't. Um, uh, electricity or running water. Some people, uh, a lot of people have cell phones and some people have access to Facebook. And so <laughs> I've been able to keep tra track of people um, and communicate with people that way. And I've also made subsequent trips since then. Um, but a, a big issue that, that's affecting the communities is drug trafficking. Um, we were talking about that earlier. Um, and uh, for instance, when I was there in 2000, 2010, um, uh, plane that was full of cocaine um, was, was flown into one of the villages who they, there isn't an airport it's a strip of land um, that you know the planes often have to like um, close the field to get the cows and things to move to move away and um, so they brought in this cocaine and then um, there were people on motorcycles with like, automatic weapons and masks on like not typical these are not members of the community um, and they moved the drugs from the plane to boats, and then they tried to just destroy the plane, burn the plane, and almost caught the church on fire. And you know the stories just keep mounting of people who are in jail or who have died because of um, their involvement or their resistance to drug trafficking through the area. So it's um, unfortunately um, a really difficult situation for people that live there.